Hi Cornelius. Hi Zell. Let's introduce the topic of today. So today's topic is a little bit more ethereal uh, than the last two we discussed. That's nice. Practical applications. Yeah, we're going to talk about Plato's forms. Plato's forms, nice. They used to be very popular once upon a time. Uh, now they're pretty much out of favor. But I wanted to ask the question, um, is there still room for such a philosophy in the modern world? Do you know anything about the forms, though? Yes, I know a little bit about the forms. Yeah. Well, let me give you my explanation as I understand it. Um, so Plato, uh, you know, quoting Socrates the whole time, uh, basically thought, um, you know, having been uh, fairly enchanted by the math of Pythagoras and Euclid, he thought that there's a, a way to extend this discovery uh, of the fundamental parts of the universe. And so he proposed that there are things that are called forms, idealized versions of all the physical and mental things that we encounter uh, on a daily basis. And he said that uh, when we think we're learning something or discovering something, we're actually just seeing uh, what's really going on sort of behind reality, right? These things that we see all around us are just shadows of these pure forms, right? And this is the start of dualism uh, in Western philosophy, the idea that there is a reality that we see and something that's more real than real behind that. Oh boy, you are doing such a nice marketing of Plato, but can I be a little bit critical? Absolutely. I think Plato was just being lazy. So in order to understand the real world, you need to go outside and do experiments, and most of the time they fail. So he was impressed with the magicians just sitting in their uh, backyard and drawing circles on the sand and coming to conclusion. So he was thinking maybe the entire world can be discovered just by process of thinking. So his la laziness induced that kind of Plato's forms thingy. Well, I would say Socrates was the laziest among them. You know, even, even on his deathbed, he was literally drinking. Um, you know, you could definitely make an argument that experimentation is the only way to uh, find out the truth behind something. But uh, theory has uh, often led to experimentation, which proves a theory to be true. And people come up with their theories, you know, through contemplation. You know, usually it's not through constant experimentation that you find a new theory. Usually yeah, but that's different. That's different because what Plato's form said essentially that everything which is true is a form and this material world is only a shadow. And that got taken ex and exaggerated by people after that, especially in religious contexts, where Platoist uh, uh, forms were official uh, philosophy of medieval times and Christian scholars who just continued traditional Plato. So it, it kind of became an excuse for not doing science thing. Uh, you would just conclude something by sitting down thinking or reading uh, the stuff in the Bible. I agree. Uh, there's, uh, you know, lots of bad ways to use philosophy. But let me set up a couple of different arguments here, and, I, and I'll see what you what you tell me Can't about wait. why Plato's forms could be a reality. So I'll take uh, my favorite example of this, which is the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no airplanes 200 years ago, but people dreamt of flying. Um, millions of years ago, there were no flying things at all. But the principles that would make an airplane fly on this planet or on any other planet with an atmosphere were there. Essentially, there is something fundamental to the universe baked mm -hmm. into reality that makes all airplanes participate in the same form. Um, and why not that there's something deeper behind what we're seeing that actually forces us to, I don't know, walk on the ground and not on the ceiling? I think the, the stuff you are talking about has some argumentation, but it's all the same problem with uh, forms and idealism and that people are mixing math, which is inherent to the mind, because you start with axioms you define and real world, which doesn't start with axioms you define. And you don't know which is the base of laws of the universe. Uh, do, do you follow me on that? I do. I, I like you bringing up the mind because that gives me another angle at an argument. Yeah, let me just f follow up with, with your planes. So planes all look the same because of uh, uh, physical laws and physical laws are the same entire universe and we can describe them with the math. But the uh, 
kind of basis of uh, uh, aerodynamics and physics of it can be different in different universes. This mat is not the only mat that can exist. Oh, so now I have to talk about different universes. Yes. Okay, so another argument that I would give you is that uh, we all know that um, one of our favorite science fiction tropes is multiple universes, perhaps even infinite universes. Yes. And there's, a, there's some math that might say that uh, such things exist. Yes. If they do, we would probably expect to see some similar universes, right? There'd be a universe where I have different colored hair. Yep. There'd be a universe where I had a better job or a universe where I was, you know, killed in a horse crash. And there might or a be... universe where we are both beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Um, at least one of us is. Um, and there could be a universe where I don't exist at all. Um, but there would be similarities, we would think, between these universes. Uh, the science fiction author Neil Stevenson said that what makes these similarities happen would be something called attractors, right? Something that forces all things to look the same, right? A universe without gravity wouldn't really be a universe at all. It would just be, you know, a bunch of particles flying around. You couldn't even really observe anything. Uh, so we would expect in these universes for there to be some consistency. Could those be things that are... Uh, what Plato was talking about when he talked about forms? So basically what you're going to do, you're just saying that Plato's forms are actually laws of physics or maybe laws of mathematics, which are behind these laws of physics. But that was not the thing that Plato said. Tell me more. So the Plato said that the the real world is just a shadow of a world of ideas and we can get to real ideas without observing or experimenting. We can just think what is the essence of something and when we know the essence of something we know it's true because it's the essence and that's, that's the thing that uh, materialists and rationalists never liked about uh, uh, that kind of idealism because rationally you can say, okay, that may be the case, but there are so many ways the reality can uh, uh, replay and so many physical laws that can be put into action. Do you follow me? That was, uh, that was Aristotle's direct argument against yes. forms. You have too many forms, one form for every situation. A perfect yes. horse needs a perfect leg, which needs a perfect knee, which needs a perfect piece of ligament. And then it goes recursion ad infinitum, yes. Yeah, but Plato wouldn't have said that, you know, anyone can, you know, enter this world of ideal forms. He knew we were stuck in this universe, and, you know, the process of learning, he said, was merely one of remembering, as he showed that one kid in the dirt in one of his dialogues. I forget which one. We don't have to go into that. Let me try a different one on you. You've heard of the theory that we're almost definitely living in a computer simulation, right, Zell? Yeah, that's quite common, and uh, the, the nicest interpretation of that was metrics. Yeah, I don't know about robots needing us to be batteries. If they have a form of fusion, that seemed like a bit of a cop-out. But uh, the, the latest one on the internet is uh, the idea that if there's an advanced race that makes a giant video game to include a whole universe, um, over time, eventually one of these races will do it. And if a race can do it over time, they'll probably do it many millions of times. Which means that out of all the millions of possible realities, only one is the real reality. And statistically speaking, we're living in that simulation right now. In which case, these things that Plato glimpsed, you know, from behind the fire in that cave, uh, might have been bits of programming architecture. What do you think of that? Well, yes, we could say if we live in a computer simulation, that then it exists a real world of forms, which is world of computer program that is running us. But I don't think the argument holds because uh, you can have many simulated worlds, but you can have many realities. Actually, some physics count on multiverse universe. Oh, in which case, you'd get those places where you have either all the same form or all different forms. Chairs on the ceiling, for instance. I, I love the thought of sitting on the ceiling. Maybe we can make that happen with some sufficiently advanced technology. Yeah. Let me try one more, one more argument for forms. Yeah. We all uh, have evolved. Um, you know, if you're inclined towards that theory, um, mm -hmm. I think it's been proven. Um, and in our brains, we're basically pre-programmed to understand certain things, right? Um, we all instinctively know what a predator is, just like a rabbit that sees my dogs walking in the park runs away. It doesn't have to be told. It knows. We know that certain things are disgusting. Uh, we know that certain things are beneficial. 
like there's that experiment that shows that people will take zero money instead of a little bit of money uh, just to make sure that the other person who divided the money doesn't get any. Uh, because we're basically programmed to be just. And that was part of Plato's point. You call that justice, okay. Yeah, to be a real thing. Um, so maybe these forms that he was seeing were actually just things that live inside us, our, our hardware combined with our software, which makes us always want to imagine uh, a chair whenever we see something that looks like a chair. What do you think of that? I don't think that view is, that view is common, but it's not compatible with the view of evolution. And I would recommend everybody to read uh, Selfish Gene from Dawkins, which quite nicely explain how different species come to the similar behavior just to be stable in their own environment. Uh, and the whole process of you having something in a brain from the birth uh, can be explained by genes and a little bit of uh, statistics. So you're saying that over time, um, all things will, will come to pass through enough dice rolls. Yes. So you must really believe in the Buddhist maxim that uh, all things are permissible and nothing is forbidden. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I believe that every person has a, their own relative moral, even if they are not aware of it. And there's a universe somewhere with chairs on the ceiling? Yes, of course. Well, my last argument you've already, uh, you already talked about, and it's not a very strong one, uh, but if you believe in God, you kind of have to believe in forms, right? Unless yeah, God that's true. That's true. not doing anything. He had some ideas when he, he put the Lego set together. Um, I see I haven't convinced you. No. I find it a very seductive theory. I would like justice and mercy to be real things, uh, but it's entirely possible that they're just words and we use them conveniently uh, and discard them hypocritically when they're not needed. Now you're reading my mind. <laughs> Thanks, El. It's been good. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Until awesome. next time. Bye. See you.